Section 8 is for me. Mm-hmm. Veteran housing is for me. Um, some kind of shelter program is for me. Like, all of that where you don't... Look, the government's never laid on rent, bro. Mm-hmm. The government's never laid on rent. So why would I want to now deal with the mentality of which I mentioned to y'all? A lot of people know the game, and they're going to screw you over on your rent. It's like crap you. Like, now it's to the point where you... As a landlord, you kind of in a tight spot of raising your rent because you want to raise your rent 5%, 3%, 2%. Now I got my property management companies are like, yeah, do we even mention raising the rent? Because they're good tenants and they're paying the rent and I'm making profit. So I go, you know what? Tell them we'll do it 2%. Right. And if there's any pushback, I go, fuck it. I'm still making profit and I got mm-hmm. equity growth of an average of about 2 3% a year. So it's the same as raising mm-hmm. the rent. So my thing is, I don't, I don't want to take a chance and kick them out to get somebody who's not going to pay rent. Yeah. So that's the key thing. But um, also, key thing is when you want to find Section 8 properties, you go, to, um, you go to the HUD, Google the HUD and whatever the county of the state, the property you're looking at. Do you yeah. just see how much HUD rent is paying? Like there's a property what I was looking HUD at. What does HUD stand for? Um, housing, how, housing, urban development mm-hmm. is like Section Eight. Okay. So they pay rent. They pay the rent. Mm, right. Like there's a property I was looking at over in um, Memphis. The average rent was twelve hundred dollars, but Section Eight was paying nineteen hundred dollars. Mm. So why would I just go to Section Eight and list it? Mm. So you find a property, and here's another thing: if it's a duplex, um, with a duplex is the only time I will tell you I'm cool with buying a vacant one side of the duplex long as you got one tenant in there that's paying the rent. So now what you do is you get that other one listed to rent or you contact HUD and get that joint filled with a Section 8 mm-hmm. while the other tenant's paying rent. But fully vacant, cool. Also, renovations. I'm not the guy like to be <laughs> doing renovations or yeah. mm-hmm. working with renovations out the state. Like I see houses and people be like, yo, house cost me $700. But, you know, there's no roof, there's no floors, which is cool if you got a team that can mm. do it. But a lot of people don't know nobody with construction, especially in another state. It's like, I don't know, man. I, I, I heard I, contracting I, horror stories before. Con- contracting is worse, <laughs> but that's different. See, contracting when the house is solid is already a risky thing. Mm. But when you get in a, when you need a contractor who could do your roof, mm-hmm. who could do your foundation. Like, you need big stuff done now. You ain't even there. You hire, you pay somebody else to manage the project and get it done for you. Like if you just paid uh, $500 for that house, but now you just got a, a fix a fix and flip loan on it where now you could get it fixed and all that, that money runs out at a certain point. You got to make sure that you spent that money accordingly to get the job done. And if all that money runs and you ain't get that place done, you got to find that money. And now there's a, there's a holding cost on that money every month. So you got to take some of that money to pay for the monthly expenses on getting it, look, that, man, just buy mm. your tenant occupied property, B. Right. Mm. So now you say your plan is usually about average five years. So now yeah. when you're selling it, how do you save on your taxes, though? Because, like, I know, like, when you're selling, it's also like a huge tax bill, isn't it? Nah. It, no. Well, here's the thing when you have your LLC and you have everything set up in the right CPA, I have a structure, you know, where um, I call it the three must have LLCs. Mm-hmm. Like I've been in the game for a little while. I don't recommend nobody who just have one property to do it. It's like you get a couple properties. I use one LLC as an acquisition to buy my properties. Mm-hmm. It holds the mortgages. I use another LLC as my holding to hold the property after I bought it. So I bought it in one property that has the mortgage. Then I'll take that property, transfer it out of that LLC into a holding to, for anonymity. And now the mortgage is on one LLC. The property is being held in another LLC. Then I have the third LLC was the property management. That property management one, it collects the rent. Mm-hmm. Why is that so important? Because if you have the same LLC you bought the property in and you holding the property in, if somebody sues the LLC and your bank account is attached to that LLC, they season it up. They freeze the bank account. Your money is frozen. Mm-hmm. Plus, you're not being wise about it because you need to master the fact that you got a separate property management company. So now you're the property manager managing your own companies. You paying yourself a salary. Now that's a tax write-off. You get that property management company in your state. Now you're writing off things like having a home office. You're writing off, you're writing off this, like right now, if you, if you, you can write this off as an expense. You can write off a portion of your light, gas, mortgage, rent, 
car depreciation. There's an app called Everlance that tracks the mileage, and that's all your accountant need is the miles. Wow. And now if you take trips, I tell everybody, there's a good book you need to read called Tom Will Write Tax-Free Wealth. When you read that book, it talks about book and vacations. I'm an out-of-state investor. So if I want to go look at, if I want to go on vacation in Florida for the weekend, I would set up a, a real estate meeting on Thursday and a real estate meeting on Monday. I went to that meeting on Thursday. I'm in Florida. What am I doing until Monday? I'm on vacation. Mm -hmm. And all I need to do, get my sign-in sheets. And I'm there. I can write off easy 50 to 75% of that vacation. Like, you don't, you guys are businesses. Right now, what you're doing, you should have your EIN, your LLC, and your business credit cards. And you need to be paying off, like using that business credit card to pay for your vacations, pay for your trips. You know why? You're going to look at different sites where you might want to shoot your podcast. You went to go meet with a client. That's a write-off. Mm -hmm. You out eating dinner. That's a write-off. Use your business credit card. You're on your cell phone. That's a write-off because you're on a business credit card. I mean, making business calls. That's a write-off on your taxes. You're at home. You're doing business at home. You should have a desk, a, a desk and a laptop. So now you can write off these expenses. But we don't take ourselves seriously as business people until we start making business. Amazon was losing money for about 10 years before they start making a profit. Writing off millions of dollars. How come you're not writing off millions of dollars? Like, portion of millions of dollars. How come you're not writing off getting new gear, new sneakers, stuff you need to wear? You see, my employee millionaire, this is a write-off. Because my logo was on it. We not thinking like that. We like, yo, man, when I make it big, when I'm doing that, that, this, everything I'm sitting here with y'all right now, you should be writing this expense off. If you ain't writing this off, it's a problem.